ES Audio. Hello, we're back with the latest Evening Standard Theatre podcast. I'm Nick Curtis, the Evening Standard's Chief Theatre Critic. And I'm Nick Clark, the Deputy Culture Editor. Nancy Durrant, our Culture Editor, is here also, but down the line because she is unwell. Nancy, it's heroic of you to join us. It's no problem at all. Yes, I'm here and we've got such a great show this week. Coming up, we'll be reviewing Fedra, starring Janet McTeer at the National Theatre. Plus, we'll be speaking to the cast of the Lehman Trilogy. Sam Mendes happened to be in that night, and we were in the canteen back at the National. I just went up to him and said, listen, Sam, why aren't I in this? I was a stockbroker. I'm Jewish. My grandfather stowed away on a boat to New York. When he asked me to do it, he said to me, remember that time we had a chat about four or five years ago? And he said, why aren't I in it? I remembered. Which is now on at the Gillian Lynn Theatre. So let's kick off with our first review. It's Standing at the Sky's Edge at the National Theatre's Olivier Auditorium. As the dawn breaks over roofs lays hope Three households decades apart sharing one roof, one hope to matter to someone. This is a co-production with uh, Sheffield Theatres. It was previously done at the Sheffield Crucible Theatre and uh, Sheffield is really at the heart of of the, the, the three stories that it tells, although I guess the message of the show is universal. It's about the Park Hill Estate, which was built in the late 50s and early 60s, was a sort of utopian housing development replacing slums, fell into disrepair in the, in the 1980s and was then reinvented this century as a sort of desirable, brutalist home for young professionals. So it weaves together these three storylines written by Chris Bush, a local writer, with music by uh, Richard Hawley, a local singer, songwriter and multiply lauded and nominated uh, songmaker. Some time of pulp. Some time of pulp. I really enjoyed this, not just because I'm a, a fan of brutalist architecture, and this is, 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 as well as many other things, as well as a very engrossing uh, human, interwoven human story across several decades. It's also a sort of dialogue between modernist brutalist buildings from the National, the Crucible, and Park Hill. Quite often I find musicals where pre-existing songs are pressed into service don't always work, and I would say 80 to 90% of the songs here actually work perfectly. One of the things about this one you know people always say jukebox musicals and I know we're not supposed to call this a jukebox musical but you know in a technical sense that people don't like them but actually I've been humming those songs for two days now. It's an extraordinary uh, cast of singers and there's so many people from across this huge cast. Yes. I mean we counted sort of 28, 29 something like that. Yeah. And and everyone can can carry a tune. I mean not just carry a tune they can knock it out of the park. Uh, it's, it's interesting that it takes about a third of the way through they bring on Maimuna Memon who is one of the, the most astonishing singers out Absolutely. there at the moment I think. She's got one of the most amazing voices in theatre, mm. I think. I agree, yes. She is a singer-songwriter as well as a, as well as a performer, but I, I first became aware of when she played um, Mary Magdalene at the Open Air Theatre, and she mm. just blew the entire audience away there and did it again here. I think one of the real standouts in a, in a sort of cast of, frankly, amazing singers pretty much from start to finish is Faith Amole's Joy. She's a very young girl, about 15, when she starts the play. And there's a moment right at the beginning when there are three women singing and there are two of them do their bit. And then and then she suddenly opens her mouth and this massive voice comes yes. charging out. And it's really, it sort of pins you to your seat. And also the, the development of her character, because she starts off with a very strong Liberian accent, and then she gradually mm. adopts bits of Sheffield and yes. bits of Liberian, and it's beautifully, it's really, really cleverly strong done. Strong performance. Really, there. really beautifully done. And a, a word quickly for Robert Lonsdale as Harry and uh, Rachel Wooding as Rose, mm. who are the um, trades unionist uh, at the Steelworks, and, and his wife. This is a, a lovely, unsentimental portrait of late 50s, early 60s working class life. She is a, a wonderful sort of pillar of strength. He is very affectionate, quite domineering, but as it turns out, essentially rather weak. He can't cope with the loss, the erosion, the gradual erosion yeah. of his role, which which um, worsens with the deindustrialization of Sheffield. Nancy, did you think the different choreography of the three households on top of each other worked? Was it was it, was it good theatricality to you? It did. I think it's, they start out quite um, carefully by giving you the dates. There's a rather sort of nice kind of ingenious effect that they have with 
kind of clocks that come down and, and tell you what year you're in. And then as soon as you've got used to the characters, they get rid of them, which is exactly the right thing to do because you know who they are and they know what you know when it's happening. And then you can focus on the slow development and revealing of the links between those families. And I think that was done really nicely because you don't it's not thudding. There's just the odd line and you go, oh, is that that person's you know is that person related to that person is that how they get the, they link together and it's just I think it's really nicely done yes there's a lovely reveal about the estate agent Connie yes. at the end isn't there which sort of ties no over. spoilers Nick. no spoilers <laughs> I'm not gonna I'm, no, no, I'm not gonna blow it I, I think a, a word for the set and costume designer yeah. Ben Stones oh people were taking photos as they came in I heard a lot of gasps when they saw that set <laughs> yes. it was really affecting I mean and we should say that by the end uh, you know there was I wasn't there at press night but People were on their feet. I was hearing sobbing, which I thought was, you know, real testament to this to this show that deals with massive themes, but also makes it very human. I mean, I'd say if I only had a minor quibble with it, I've got to say the way that at least one of the stories was tied up was not a way that I would have uh, particularly liked. But that's the that's the way of these things. Sometimes, indeed, yes, there is. I mean, there's a because there are three storylines happening at the same time. Mm. There is a slight sense that. Things happen a bit too neatly. They are tied mm. up a bit, a bit neatly, and yeah. uh, in order to sort of uh, get all the issues that, that the show wants to address in, there's sometimes it's a bit too pat at moments. But that would be that, and the and the, some reservations about the deployment of some of the songs mm. would really be pretty much my only reservations about it. I think mm. it's a wonderful uh, show. I think it's also exactly what the National should be doing. Yep. I think this is sort of what Rufus Norris, the National Theatre's artistic director, set out to do: mm. is to make it more of a truly national theatre with co-productions with other theatres around the country mm. and I think this has been probably the most fruitful one so far. After the break, we'll be joined by Nigel Lindsay, Michael Balligan and Hadley Fraser of the Lehman Trilogy in London's West End. We'll be back after these. I'm delighted to be here at the Gillian Lynn Theatre with the three stars of the multi-award winning play, The Lehman Trilogy, which has recently arrived in the West End. So welcome to the Evening Standard Theatre podcast, Michael Balligan, Hadley Fraser and Nigel Lindsay. Thank, Thank you. you. So Nigel, many people know the Lehman name. A lot of it will be to do with the financial crash and there'll be a, uh, you know, a lot tied to the financial crisis. But this is so much more. I wonder... If you can, can you give us an overview of what the Lehman Trilogy is about? It runs from 1844 when the first Lehman brother uh, emigrated from Germany over to, uh, well, he landed in New York and then set up a shop in Alabama and then uh, sent for his two brothers. And they, from that tiny shop and through several generations, they grew the Lehman Empire that we knew, which crashed in 2008. So it, it covers the whole whole gamut of the beginnings right through to the crash and we the three of us play well about 30 different people i would say over the court we play we play the three original brothers and then their sons their daughter-in-laws their wives the you know all through the generations right through to the end it was five hours in italy it's a uh, a, a small three hours and 20 over here um you must be working every single muscle every you know how do you feel compared with other shows? Can I start with you, Hadley, and then we'll... Yeah, Mike and I were talking about this the other night, actually. Uh, you know, I've done quite a few musicals. I know Nigel has as well. And, and there's something that are physically quite demanding. You know, you're dancing and running around and changing mm. costumes. And You've done Phantom and Les Mis. And yeah, all the... City of Angels. All of those, yeah. yeah. And they can certainly be physically tiring. This one is unlike I've, anything I've done just because of the mental... Uh, fatigue, I think, that accumulates. And because all three of us are on stage the whole time, and it probably, apart from when Nigel sets us up brilliantly at the beginning, when M Mike and I are waiting to come on for, what is that? 10, 15, 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Beyond that point, when none of us is ever really out of action for more than about 10 seconds. So you never have that sort of fallow period that you might expect in another production where you can reset or re-energise or sort of cancel something that's gone wrong. I don't know. Very few performers may experience this because it is a three-hander and it's three hours long and you're always on apart from the time when night isn't. Mm. So I've, like me, me and like Hadley said, we were speaking about when you come off, I've lost weight, like just from doing the show. 
and it's a different kind of energy. You, you need to fuel up. You need to have those vitamins. You need to get the water in. You need the carbs. You need the cashew nuts. You need them. Because if you don't have them, you, I don't know, you just feel a little flag or you'll drop a line. And it's a real testament to staying in the moment as well. Like yesterday, I've flipping cut out a page of text. Because, because, <laughs> wait, no, Sam Mendes ain't going to hear this, is he? But yeah, I cut out a page of text because I was not, I was thinking about a moment that I wasn't in. And it's a real skill in just, you know, taking care of yourself. So this is, this is, I've never done anything like this. And I did a one man show at the National, you know, where it's just me on stage playing multiple characters. This is a different kind of beast. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't wish it on anyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I met Simon Russell Beal for a, a coffee and- uh, Who had the role Who, who had the role before, yeah. yeah. And um, he was saying to me, it's not like King Lear in terms of the emotional wreckage that you have, but it's just as taxing physically and mentally in a different way. This, you're never off stage. And as Sam Mendes said, don't show them the gears that you're going into. So if you're about to play the wife of Bobby Lehman, don't go, hey folks, watch this. I'm gonna turn my collar up and here I, just do it. And that is really difficult to do, I find. And you do have a great origin story of, of um, approaching the director. I wonder if you could tell oh. us how. <laughs> <laughs> no, I told you this. No, I, I went to see the show with Patrick Marber. Sam Mendes happened to be in that night. And we were in the canteen in, in, back at the National. And uh, I just went up to him and said, listen, Sam, why aren't I in this? I was a stockbroker. I'm Jewish. My grandfather stowed away on a boat to New York in 1920. I mean, it's tailor-made, and he, he giggled. And then when he asked me to do it, he said to me, do you know, remember that time we had a chat about four or five years ago, and you said, why aren't I in it? I said, oh, yeah, did I say that? I did say that. He said, I remembered. And I thought, in the 30 years I've been doing this, that's never worked. I always say to young actors, don't go and bug people, because it never works. <laughs> but it did. So, so there you go. Yeah. And did you draw on those three aspects of your life and your heritage? Certainly not on the banking aspect. Mm. Um, the immigrant aspect, definitely. I mean, I start the play as Henry, the oldest brother, uh, stepping off the boat in, well, he's in Ellis Island. My grandfather actually stowed away on a boat, um, got found by the sailors, and one of them took pity on him and gave him his identity papers. So this little Jewish man, four foot 11, pretend to be this strapping Irishman called Herman Kelly. I always remember that name and, and went through normal immigration. Um, I was on Broadway in 2000 with my, uh, with my wife and my young baby. And my wife was very conscious of the immigrant situation that I came from. And she took me to Ellis Island. And it's a massive hall. I don't know if you've been there. It's a massive hall with a great wood floor. And we were very lucky. There was no one else there on that day. And she made me take my shoes and socks off and hold my cap as if I'd just got off a boat. And, and we had that photo framed and stuck up on our wall for years. And, uh, and I, it, it really reminded me when I do this. But I do get a little free song. There is definitely that connection. Mm. Hadley, your character, Maya, he talks a lot about trust and belief and manages to get people to trust him and believe in him. And it's sort of the, the shift from belief in investment in cotton, in railways, which are things they see and can touch, to belief in these weird financial products that they can't and no one can. There's, I think, a bit of poetic license in, in, in how the brothers actually sort of, how they were positioned, which is natural, you know, it's a play, but certainly in terms of the play, Maya, and then latterly Bobby, I suppose, as, as well, or, or, or even more so, becomes this sort of disciple of, of, of nothingness, you know, finance that, that, that's just thin air. I think, Mike, you've got a line where you say something like, he made the simple things complicated, yeah, yeah. so complicated that they'd never be understood again. You know, you ask someone to explain to you some of the things, you know, subprime mortgages, the things that Margot Robbie explains to us in the bathtub, in, in, um, in a big short, even someone in finance can't explain that to us. And so that transition from things, you know, from the gold standard to the stuff being on, on a computer is a sort of terrifying, and it's sort of on fast forward too. You know, it's not like it happened over a sustained period of time. It's almost like at one point everyone just woke up and went, oh, it doesn't need, doesn't need to mean anything. It can just be numbers on a screen. And but it, this feels like a play to me that 
I'd love to come back and watch. I'm sure, you know, as we talked, it's layer upon layer. There's all sorts of all sorts of stuff that audiences can take away. Is it something that the actors as well? Are you constantly learning, or do you feel now you've, you've hit a point and you're just no? I definitely with feel it? like there's still things to dig out of the text. There's still things to explore. There's still things to work on. That's the beauty of a play like this because, you know, when we when we finished rehearsing in the room, I I didn't feel ready to go into the theatre. If I'm going to be honest. And during the previews and, you know, things have come out and enriched and things have dropped in moments that I did probably didn't really quite grasp. So I think it's that kind of play where every time you go on, there's going to be different things. The audience respond. Every audience is completely different, obviously, but the way they respond to the play is always completely different. I'll just say a line like, no, I've never had a laugh on. And people start laughing. I'm like, oh. I don't know. What's happening there? I've been dropping my trousers. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it's that kind of text. You know, there's so much in it. So it, so there is an element of that, you know, of the, of the layers being revealed as we keep doing it. You're not going to get bored. No. <laughs> it doesn't feel that way. And also because I suppose that the boys who did it to begin with, you know, did four or five different incarnations of it. You know, that suggests that there is always, mm. like you say, Mike, mm. things to learn and things to reveal. Yeah. As I said, it, it is a privilege to do this. It's absolutely knackering. But, um, you know, I got a text from Adam Godley, who was originally Maya in it um, the day before, and he said, just when you're on your last legs, just remember, you know, how lucky you are to be in, in this theatre doing this play. And, and that has, it is true. That does sort of keep me going sometimes 100%. on a two-show day. Yeah, it's a challenge, but it's a fantastic challenge. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's an extraordinary play. You guys are all absolutely extraordinary in it. Um, thank you for taking the time. And um, yeah, to our listeners, I can't recommend it highly enough. So um, Michael, Hadley, Nigel, thank you so much for joining the Evening Standard Theatre podcast. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks, thanks for having us. After the break, Nick and Nancy review Fedra starring Janet McTeer. If you're enjoying the show and want to hear more, hit follow and rate. Welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre podcast. Uh, now we're talking about Fedra, also at the National Theatre, starring Janet McTeer. And Nick, you really loved this one, didn't you? I did. This uh, is one of the Marmite shows. Quite a few of the critics absolutely hated this. I really liked it. It's by Simon Stone, who was previously best known here. He's an Australian director and writer, uh, previously best known here for a revelatory reworking of Yerma with Billy Piper at the Young Vic. This is a similarly radical reworking of the various uh, Fedra legends by Seneca, Euripides, Racine. It updates it to the uh, basically what what I suppose one would call um, a contemporary elite, to uh, use a, a fairly loaded term. Here, our Fedra is called Helen. She's played by Janet McTeer. She's a shadow minister for the environment, I believe. She's incredibly wealthy. She's married to an Iranian expat diplomat played by Paul Shahidi. She suddenly discovers that the son of her Moroccan former lover has turned up on her door with disastrous consequences. I mean, let's talk about the things we both liked about it at first, because I have one very strong reservation, but it is a, an oh. exhilarating show, mm -hmm. and I want to give it some love for that reason. Reason. I mean, I think Janet McTeer is magnificent. I agree. That was the word I used in my review. She is. It's it's so nice to have her back on stage, isn't it? She's just riveting. Yeah, I think the watch. last thing I saw her in was um, Dangerous Liaisons at the Donmar, and she just absolutely queened it as Madame de Merteuil. But I just here, I, I, just, I mean, she's just. You can't take your eyes off her. But but I loved all the performances, actually. I love Paul Chahidi, who plays her husband, uh, Hugo. He's such a kind of warm actor. And so when he, he's very funny, and then when he does get chilly, you really, really yes. feel it, don't you? He's a lovely actor, uh, sort of unsung, I think. You know, a character performer. Um, TV viewers may know him as the vicar from this England. But he's he's a, he's a stalwart of the stage and he is he's superb in this and absolutely a match for McTeer. Um it's it's very much an ensemble performance. I think Stone is known for rewriting a lot in rehearsals that actors never know, you know, what they're going to be given that day and they are asked to chip in for their characters. And you sense that in the early scenes where everybody's talking over each other. It's a it's a very sort of realistic, in some ways, portrait of what family life is like. That is really clever at the beginning because you do, everyone, there's this sort of cacophony of people chatting to each other and then, but that does sort of drop off after a bit. So it kind of feels, it sort of feels brilliant and then, and then 
a little bit like it was a kind of showpiece, you know, that opening scene. Yes. But doesn't make I it think, any less brilliant in its own self, I think. I think you're right. I think it's also probably probably essential. It would probably be unwatchable if there were two plus hours of, of people talking over each other constantly. The fact that it happens a couple of times remind you reminds you sort of that theatre is a distillation of real life, really, uh, and a clarification a lot of the time. And that's what real life is 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 more like. Asad Buab, um, who Netflix viewers will know from uh, Call My Agent, he is, I think, fantastic as uh, the son of her late Moroccan lover and, you know, the young man who throws a major spanner in the works. And he's a political refugee um, and he sort of treads that line, I think, uh, between kind of vulnerable and dangerous, which injects a real sort of electricity into the production. Yes, that's that's absolutely right. I think, um, Nick, you'll be able to tell me probably, is this his, I mean, he's been on stage in France for years, but is this his first British production? As far as I know, it's his first British production. He has been in, he was a stage actor before he was a TV actor in France, and he has been in Racine's Fedra before, so he's got form on uh, transgressive relationships <laughs> on stage. I don't think we're giving much away if we say that this hinges on a transgressive relationship. Also, I'd just like to put a mention in for Mackenzie Davis, who plays the daughter of McTeer and Shahidi's character, um, who is making her stage debut here. She's she's well known to TV and film viewers, Canadian actress. Um, I think she's superb here as Isolde, the daughter. Again, there's a sign in the fact that she's called Isolde. That's yet another um, story of a doomed and dangerous love. Yeah, he does love his doomed um, ladies, doesn't he? I, I think if you find yourself as a woman in a Simon Stone production, you know it's not going to end well for you. It's true. The thing is, I think it's really worth seeing in many ways, but as you said in your review, you know, that it was sort of gobsmackingly audacious to turn the Greek myth of a woman in love with her stepson into a satire on smug London elites while retaining its transgressive, tragic power. It's the latter part of that statement that I don't agree with, because I don't think it does retain that tragic power, to be honest. I feel like, I'm going to try not to rant now, but it's not a tragedy. It's a play about an awful person doing awful things. If you look at something like Macbeth or Othello or whatever, you know, the playwrights at pains to show us that that person has a kind of nobility of character from the start, which is undermined, but in Macbeth's case, by ambition, in Othello's case, by jealousy. This Fedra is, and I think, to be honest, I think this is the case in certainly in the Seneca, I don't know about the others. She's irredeemably awful right from the start. Like she is entitled, she is selfish, but most of all, she's got all the power. She's got power over her husband. She's got power over her children. She's got power over this young man. He's, you know, she, he, he remembers her as this extraordinary kind of angel of sort of sex and death from his youth because uh, his father left the family for her. And also she's a politician and he is a political refugee. She clearly had power over the father, which was a sexual power, had much less to lose than him. Um, and, for me, I loved the first half. I loved it. And then by minutes into the second, I just thought there is nothing here that makes me give a damn. I ended up in this sort of really unedifying position of thinking the world would be a much better place without this woman. <laughs> if only she hadn't so comprehensively <laughs> cocked everything up for everyone else in the meantime. I think that's I think that's absolutely fair. I suppose I agree, I think, with the point about tragedy. I suppose my point was about that the the the, the nature of the sexual relationships in it still seem shocking. Yeah, sort of. It sort of does. But, I mean, I think in a way making her a politician made it seem a bit less shocking because we're constantly getting, you know, like ridiculous exposés for the last kind of 30 years of politicians doing outrageous things because they think that they can get away with anything. So, it, in you know, if she'd been a, I don't know, a sort of humanitarian lawyer or just something else, but being a being a kind of an opposition politician with a gilded life, it just was like, oh, well, yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing that she would think was perfectly acceptable just because she wants to do it. I still would call it a must-see. I think it's 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 tonally totally dissimilar to anything out there at the moment. Simon Stone is obviously a, a really interesting figure. Um, 
it's it's. Uh, I wonder how much is down to do with his approach coming from Australian culture. He's given some very interesting interviews about masculinity and why women are important to him and uh, why women's stories, why women are his heroes. Really, again, you you would look at Janet Matias' character in that and think, really, <laughs> is that true? I would definitely say it's worth seeing. Nancy, I think you disagree. No, no, I think it's worth seeing. It just it it might it might make you cross. <laughs> at least it will get a reaction out of people. That's Fedra at the National Theatre. That's it for this episode of the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. I'm Nick Curtis. I'm Nancy Durrant. And I'm Nick Clark. We'll be back next Sunday. Make sure you hit rate, follow and leave us a review. See you soon. <laughs>